Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week for the winter and spring semester 2023. Been starting off with a pretty exciting set of topics, and today will be no exception. And I think we can call today's topic maybe a little bit um, breathtaking. Stick around. You'll find out why. But before we do, if you've been following this channel and have really, really enjoyed it, uh, feel free to hit that subscribe button. We'd really appreciate it. Um, and also hit that like button, the notification bell, so you can be reminded when other lectures come out and what, when other videos come out. And if you really like it, definitely share it with your friends. We really appreciate kind of you helping us get the word out about how ultrasound can benefit you and your patients in your clinical practice. A trauma shift. Either you're in the emergency department or you are on EMS, makes it even more exciting, and you are paged out to a motor vehicle accident, roll over on a country road, speed limits there, probably 45 to 55 miles an hour, at least as a recommendation for the speed limit, uh, heavy damage passenger entrapment. It's gonna be pretty exciting. This is what you roll up on scene to find, right? You have this big car uh, that's all mangled and messed up. It's gonna definitely require the fire department uh, and the engine company to cut the patient out and get to you. But what you are told is that you have a patient that is 34 years old, 34 year old male who's been involved in a motor vehicle accident, severe head and chest trauma, right? So you as the EMS crew do your thing and you bring them to the hospital, right? Now let's change hats. We're gonna be the, the team in the hospital taking care of this patient. And we are told at least on arrival or pre-arrival that the patient was intubated by EMS. And when they get there, you confirm, yep, they have an airway in place. And we're gonna go through our typical ACLS ABCs, right? We've talked about this before, but we're gonna go through the airway, the breathing and the circulation of the primary survey. So airway, they're intubated. Breathing, well, we're bagging for them. That bag seems to have some pretty decent compliance, so there's no, no factor there at this point. And C for circulation, we have a blood pressure of 112 over 68. It's hard to say what that means, uh, but in a person who's young, that may be normal. We're going to keep an eye on that. Heart rate 78, that's reassuring. The respirations are 18, uh, but that's a bagged rate, so we don't really know what they really are. And they're 90% saturated, again, BVM ventilations, it's plugged into the oxygen tank. Got to look into that and see kind of what's going on, what we can do about that. Secondary survey. So we start at the top, work our way down from a head standpoint. The pupils are equal around. You notice a deformity to the nose. There's some blood coming from the nose, so obvious you know, facial injuries. Dentition are intact. Mid-face is stable, so we're not worried significantly about a Lafort injury at this point. But we have some evidence of facial injuries, probably when they hit their nose on the steering wheel or the dash or the, the, um, the windshield or something to that effect. Moving down to the neck, trachea is midline. There's nothing obvious there. Chest has some ecchymosis. Makes sense. They hit their chest pretty hard on the steering wheel, maybe the seatbelt as well. R respirations diminished. Hmm. Okay, put a put a, um, a marker in that one. We'll come on back to it. Abdomen, soft, and you have some bruising kind of the lower abdomen. Again, consistent with the seatbelt sign. EMS said that the seatbelt was on. And uh, for extremities, there's no deformities, well perfused. Neuro, their GCS 3T. That's mostly our fault because we intubated the patient, or at least EMS's fault, because uh, they intubated the patient. But we don't really get a good neuro exam just because they're, you know, obtunded, sedated at this point. Um, so we're going to have to circle back on that one. Skin, warm and dry, no obvious other injuries other than what was in identified above. So that's our basic secondary survey. And we'll move on to a little bit more about the patient. So again, the vitals are 110 over 85. Heart rate's starting to tick up a little bit, 110. Again, we're bagging them at about 18. So they're on the vent at this point. Um, and their stats are starting to drop a little bit, 85%. Okay, so we take them off the vent, bag them, pretty easy compliance. Suction the tube, we get some faint bilateral breath sounds, and um, you know, continue on with what's you know to see how how this resuscitation is going to progress and see if we can get those sats back up and figure out why they're setting a little bit low. And we continue to move on. Now all of a sudden the pressures are starting to drop, right? 90 over 50. So that's not that's not good. It's concerning. And what's even more concerning is the heart rate starting to drop. And actually, over my years of practice, I found that the heart rate being slow is one of the most scary vital signs because um, it's really hard to fix, right? It's, it's something's going wrong significantly, right? Uh, especially if it was normal before. And I got to fix that um, so I can get that heart rate back up. So 40 is, is not good. Again, the vent's working, right? They're 18, <laughs> 18 breaths a minute, but those sats keep dropping. And so this really begs us the question, what do we do? 
right? We're, we're in this critical situation. The patient is severely injured. Injured. Remember, head and face trauma. We've got some chest trauma, some abdominal trauma. We have these vital signs that are really starting to go sideways, kind of messing up our day, definitely messing up the patient's day. What do we do next, right? And if you think about it in broad categories, and this is the way I like to think about things, so then I can categorize, narrow things down, and kind of work my differential in that that fashion, there's really basically three things that we can do for this patient. Number one is we could do nothing. Pretty lousy idea. I mean, given the trajectory that this patient's going, I think that doing nothing is probably not going to work out so well. Um, the second thing we could do is the wrong thing. And the third thing we could do is the right thing, right? And I challenge you to find another option, right? Wrong thing, right thing, or nothing. Um, and so ultimately, two of these three lead to something really, really bad, right? Nothing and the wrong thing are going to lead to death, right? If for no other reason, then you didn't fix the problem as to why this patient's suddenly decompensating. I mean, 34-year-olds don't just up and die without uh, a good reason most of the time, right? Uh, finally, you could do the right thing. And if you do, congratulations, the patient didn't die. You're a hero and you have... Um, you know, lived up to your, your profession, right, of being a physician. So um, the goal here today is to help us see in this scenario, right, we're going to use this scenario to kind of paint a picture so we can really work this problem and say, okay, what is the right thing to do here? Um, how do we get to that answer? And can ultrasound help? And so that's going to lead us to our introduction here. We are going to talk about ultrasound guiding our airway management, right? So ultrasound guided intubation. Um, for for the rest of this time that we're together, right? So no disclosures that I have to make here at the beginning of the conversation. So let's move on into our objectives, right? So if you like to think about it in the context of an outline, this is what we're going to be looking at, right? We're going to start with just a general overview of airway and intubation. And I presume that if you're watching this topic, you probably have a, a decent understanding of, of airway anatomy and how to control that with uh, with intubation, right? If you don't, uh, hopefully this review will be helpful. Uh, if you do, kind of suffer with me through um, just talking a little bit about some, some uh, airway and intubation stuff as a refresher, right? The second thing that we're going to talk about is ultrasound use for airway intubation or intubation confirmation, right? Followed by how do we assess for post-intubation complications, right? And then the use of ultrasound to assess the failed intubation and how we use that in that situation, right? So let's dive on into these topics and really pick off these one at a time and see how we can use ultrasound to help us with our airway, right? So number one, airway and intubation review, right? So again, I like big picture things. Big picture to intubate someone is to basically insert a plastic tube into their airway, right? It's to put that tube into their airway. Uh, it's probably not the exact etym etymology of the word, but hey, it helps to remember it. Um, and so in this situation, we're going to do an endotracheal tube uh, where we go through the mouth uh, with the laryngoscope or the video, um, video laryngoscopy and insert that tube. Uh, and we're really doing it for one of a couple, couple of different reasons, right? So number one, it's a failure of airway maintenance or protection, right? So for some reason, you as a patient are no longer able to keep your airway open. I mean, there's a lot of brain power or at least brain stem power that goes into making sure that airway stays open and making sure that the thing that makes you breathe keeps you breathing, right? So you have a lot of emphasis on getting that air in and out of your lungs, right? And so uh, if you are unable to maintain your airway or protect your airway, that's a really, really solid indi indication for intubation. We can think a lot about what are those you know, indications? Would it be you're vomiting and you're obtunded? Is it you have some airway trauma? Is it there's some obstruction in your airway? Things like that. Like what are reasons that you can't keep that thing open, right? Secondly, a reason to intubate someone is a failure of ventilation or oxygenation, right? And so maybe the airway, the tube itself, right? The natural trachea is, is fine, but you may have a problem with the the um, the neuroreflexive response to get you to breathe, right? Or your diaphragm's ability to breathe, or there's some chest trauma that prevents that from happening. And so the actual mechanics of in and out air movement isn't working so well, right? Or there's some injury to the lung that requires a greater degree of oxygenation than you can get with just breathing straight room air, right? So we have to put a tube in, we have to blow some higher concentrated oxygen to maintain those sats, right? We've seen that in spades over the last several years as we've been dealing with a, a viral respiratory pandemic, right? Um, and finally, the third indication, which is a little bit more of a soft indication, but 
it's an indication nonetheless, is anticipated clinical course. I mean, we know people, um, based on experience and how things work out, are sometimes just not going to do so hot if you leave them alone, right? And so in order to get ahead of things before they decompensate, maybe it's helpful to put, the, uh, put a, a tube in that airway so that when they become decompensated, you're not really you know, catching up um, in it, you know, in a lot of situations, it's actually safer to do prophylactically than it is when the patient finally kicks the bucket and, and, and takes a turn for the worst, right? So those are the in reasons for, in, uh, for why you'd want to intubate someone. Now, let's talk about how we're going to get this thing done, right? Um, so the goal of intubation is to maintain adequate oxygenation and ventilation and to safely insert this tube into the trachea, right? Again, big picture, we're putting a straw in an existing tube and trying to do it while the patient's still alive to keep them alive, right? Uh, so what we don't want to have happen is we don't want to have some obstruction or delay in providing those ventilations to the point that the patient's cardiorespiratory status starts to, to, to compensate. So we have this narrow window of time. Some patients are narrower than others where we can take away their ability to breathe, right? Their ability to move, things like that, and put that tube in as safely as possible, as quickly as possible, and then take over those functions before they start to deteriorate, right? And to do this, we have outlined multiple different steps. And this is, again, basic airway course stuff um, where you're going to prepare the patient, right? You're going to do your RSI. So you're going to knock them out and you're going to give them paralytics. You're going to do the laryngoscopy where you put some device in to visualize that airway. You're going to pass the tube. So once you've identified the trachea, pass the tube into that trachea. And then in some capacity, confirm that you actually did get it into the right place as opposed to putting it in the wrong place, which is going to be highly ineffective, right? If it's in the esophagus, not a lot of ventilation and oxygenation happens through the stomach. And so ideally for best patient outcomes, you want that intubation to be into the trachea so that you can ventilate the lungs, right? So those are our basic steps to our intubation, right? And so that brings us to the idea of now that we got the tube in, how do we ventilate them safely? Because really getting the tube in is half the, half the job, right? We always, you know, when we're doing an intubation in the ED, we pass the tube. Maybe it's a difficult passage. We get it in. We secure it down, right? We're good there. We listen to bilateral breath sounds. Yes, it's in the right place. And then high fives start happening like, man, that was a good job intubating the patient. But what we fail to realize is the job's only about half done at this point, right? Well, we've got the tube in, but now we need to make sure, number one, that the patient's adequately sedated so that they don't actually fight this thing, that they can actually work with the, into, with the tube. But secondly, we need to get them on the vent so that they can do, continue to do the breathing, right? If you just put the tube in and don't breathe for them, then you may, may as well not even put in the tube, right? So we need to get them back on the vent so that we can have this efficiency in the ventilation and the respiration that needs to happen, right? And so to do that, we have vents that we put them on, and there's multiple different settings that we can dial in. And this is a topic for a different conversation. But basically, in general, you're going to do, you're going to set your vent mode, right? So how is the breath going to get triggered? Is it the machine just going to push a breath in? Is the machine going to wait until the patient takes a breath and then assist it? Is the machine going to have a backup rate so that when the if the patient doesn't take a breath, it's going to push that breath in? Like, how is this thing going to happen, right? So that's our vent mode. The respiratory rate, how fast we want them to breathe, again, it kind of relates a little bit to the vent mode. Is the patient's going to trigger everything? Or you want to say, hey, I want to make sure that they get at least 18 breaths a minute, and so we're going to dial that thing into 18, right? Or, I mean, do you want to push it up higher for various different reasons? Um, thirdly, we want to set the volume. So not only does the vent breathe for you, but the vent's going to blow in a certain amount of oxygen or a certain amount of air, which contains oxygen. Uh, and how much is that, right? How much is going to be appropriate for this particular patient in front of you? And there's various different calculations for how you can get that. Uh, but nonetheless, you need to have a tidal volume set. Um, and then fourthly, your FiO2, which is going to be the fraction of inspired oxygen in the air that's being pushed into you. And so, you know, here at sea level, we're looking at, you know, what is it, about 20 some odd percent uh, FiO2. But then as you put them on the vent, maybe they have some increased oxygenation needs. So we're going to bring that up to, you know, I guess you can start it at 100%, but you want to dial that back down into, you know, something a lot lower, like 40, 50, 60%, you know, as low as you can get it on the patient for them to maintain adequate saturations. And then finally, our the, the, the parameter that we want to set is our PEEP, which is that, that positive end expiratory pressure that helps maintain those alveoli in their open, stented open state so that it doesn't take a lot of extra 
lung effort or a lot of extra barrow effort to get those to pop back open and you can maintain that that saturation uh, a lot more easily with that with that peep so that's kind of the general idea of get the tube in right the passage get them on the vent and then the final thing that we're going to really need to worry about is preventing and managing complications as they come up right uh, so in an ideal world this all works great right we just swap one to or put one tube inside another we start blowing in there and everything goes just fine but the reality is patients are complex there's various different cardiopulmonary factors that may come into play that will throw kind of a you know a wrench in the works and, and and cause some complications right so when the patient has cardiopulmonary decompensation we have to ask ourselves again two big questions is the tube in the right place or is the tube in the wrong place, right? Um, and in the right place, then we have to start working down, like, are they obstructed? Is there a pneumo? Is there some auto peeping, some equipment failure, some ARDS? Are we inac inadequately loaded on the preload side so that we you know, are hypotensive? And the list goes on, right? We're going to um, talk about different ways of doing that. Um, but the big thing that we really, 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 really need to know once we put that tube in is, is it in the right, is it in the wrong place, right? Is it still in the trachea? And if you watched it go in, is it still there, right? Because this is one thing that, you know, in EMS, like I, my, my original medical roots were in EMS. You know, one thing you constantly talk about is when you transfer a patient from the ground to the cot, the cot to the gurney in the hospital, the gurney to the CT table, the CT table back to your, um, back to your bed, are there, these are all opportunities for movement, right? You, you, the patient can, you can actually move, you know, flex or extend their neck. You could rotate it left or right, right. These are different ways that the tube itself could become dislodged and pull out of the trachea and then just kind of default slip into the esophagus. So is there any displacement, right? I guess if this is the first time you're assessing the patient after they're intubated, you got to confirm that it's in the trachea and not in the esophagus, right? There's pretty much two holes back there and it's really easy to get it in the wrong one and so you got to really make sure it's in the right hole if it's not in the esophagus that it's in the trachea right um, and then the final complication for in the wrong place is maybe you did a good job and you got it in the right place maybe you're really really excited about the job that you did and we're over aggressive about putting that tube down and all of a sudden it's too far down right and you went past the carina and you are in one of the main stem statistically speaking, the right main stem, and now you're only ventilating half the lung, right? These are all different ways that the tube could be in the wrong place. And if you have some decompensation, it's things that you need to assess for and, and confirm that none of these are going on, right? Uh, but when it comes right down to it, and you're trying to assess where is this or what's wrong with this tube, right? We have some cardiopulmonary decompensation we need a, a systemized, systematized way. And so the, the mnemonic I like to use, the DOPES mnemonic, right? The dis, D for displacement, so is it in the right or wrong place? O for obstruction, you know, when you ventilate someone, they have mucus plugging, you can kind of plug up that airway. It, it's possible, I mean, blood, you can, it, you can plug up that airway, right? So you got to make sure that it's not obstructed in any way, shape, or form. Uh, P for pneumothorax or PEEP, right? So did they drop a lung and now you have a tension pneumo that's causing some problems? Or... You know, do you not have enough PEEP on board? You need to add PEEP to kind of get those, um, the oxygenation to stay better. Um, finally, is there an equipment failure, right? So it, did you just screw up the vent settings or is your vent just not working? You know, disconnect your vent, start bagging manually, see what your compliance looks like, see if the patient improves. And then the S is for breath stacking. So particularly in your obstructed patients, like your, your asthmatic patients, where you have some obstruction to expiration, it's really easy to blow breaths in and not allow enough time for those breaths to come out. And you start stacking these breaths and then essentially you have no ventilation because the lungs are just completely full and they cannot accept any more air. And all you're doing is dealing with is dead space air. And so that the patient's gonna not do well. So again, disconnect the tube, see if you have any air rushing out as you just gently press in the chest. Uh, to take that kind of out of the out of the picture. So that's kind of a general overview of airways, intubations, how you get it done, how you look out for complications. So with that said, let's move back into this concept of a case to really illustrate what we're going to do and, and how we're going to get it done here with ultrasound, right? All right, so this time you are on LifeLight, right? Metro LifeLight, where we are being called um, to launch on scene uh, to a patient, a 42-year-old male who was involved in a motor vehicle accident, and they are in severe respiratory distress. Again, this patient has an uh, MVA with head and chest injuries, um, so ABCDE, maxillary facial trauma. They got some striderous respirations. So that's a problem, right? Their lungs are equal bilaterally, so that's at least a good thing. 
Pressures are fine. Heart rate's tacky. Tachypnic. They're setting okay for now on room air. Uh, they definitely smell of alcohol, but they move everything, right? And from an external survey of, um, you know, approach, there's really no other immediately life-threatening injury. So primary survey's done, right? So for this patient, right, there's indications to intubate them, right? They have a failure to protect and maintain their airway. They're clearly uh, intoxicated and obtunded. Uh, they definitely have some, some evidence of airway injuries with that strider. Uh, and we anticipate that things are going to pretty much go sideways, right? Whether you are in a helicopter or not, this one's probably not going to do so well just on their own healing up. But then throw on top of that that you are out in the middle of you know somewhere, apparently, um, and you have this patient, you're going to stick them in a small box, right? You're going to fire up two jet engines, so it's going to be really, really noisy. Plus, you're going to put headphones on uh, or a helmet on with headphones, and you're going to strap yourself and the patient into the back of this helicopter that is really, really the size of a, a small bathroom, right? With yes, all your supplies, but not a lot of room to work. And you're going to be up in the air for about 10, 15 minutes where you really can't get a lot of work done, right? And so if the patient goes sideways, it's going to be hard to detect that they are not doing well. And then it's going to be even harder to do things in the aircraft just because it's a a space limited environment. And so we anticipate that this clinical course is not going to go so hot um, for the next 10, 15 minutes. So what we can do on the ground to prep for the next 10, 15 minutes is really, really going to be important. And so we anticipate this clinical course is going to be uh, rocky and an intubation would be very beneficial for this patient and for the providers, right? And so in the process of doing that, we go through our checklist, right? We're going to prepare the patients. We're going to pre-ox them, put them on some oxygen, get those sats up as best as we can, bias as much apnea time as possible. We're going to do RSI. And so for whatever reason, we're going to ch choose atomate and succinylcholine for this particular patient. And then we're going to do direct laryngoscopy, right? You can do video if you want, but we're going to choose direct, right? Since it's a, a gentleman, we're going to use an 80 ET tube. So we're going to keep the ET tube size as big as possible so that we can get uh, the easiest airflow after intubation, right? Um, we're going to intubate to about 25 centimeters of depth at the teeth. And all that goes smoothly. But the one thing we can't do extremely efficiently in the pre-hospital setting is really solidly confirm that tube placement. And that's really the thing that we need to do so that when we're up at altitude for the next 10 to 15 minutes and really don't have a lot of ability to use our five senses to assess the patient, we can I, you know, make sure that we're, we're doing this in the safest um, manner possible. And so that begs a question and really begs the topic of today's conversation, can ultrasound help in this situation? And if so, how, right? And so we'll go transition now to the second phase of this conversation, and that is ultrasound confirmation uh, with or intubation confirmation with ultrasound, right? And again, keeping things big picture, tube in the right place, tube in the wrong place. We're really going to help identify that the tube is not in the wrong place or identify that it is and rapidly fix that, right? And so when we do that, when we confirm our airway placement, we want to really confirm two things, right? Number one, we want to confirm the location of the tube, whether it's tracheal, esophageal, and we've been talking about that all this whole time for now. And number two is we really want to assess the depth of that tube. So did we get it to where we need it to be above the carina or are we main stemmed? Did we push it down too far uh, and we're only ventilating half the lungs, right? And there's a number of different ways that this can be done uh, in the pre-hospital setting or even the hospital setting that can be helpful. Uh, but again, we're going to find limitations for all of these. So uh, here's a list, and we're going to go over these in, in just a sec here, but you can look directly. You can use a CO2 de detector, an end tidal detector, uh, the tube condensation, or one of those bulb aspirators, all different ways to confirm where you're at. And then assessing the depth, listen to the lungs. Typically, it's done with a chest X-ray, um, but we'll see how ultrasound can maybe help us out here. So direct visualization, this is really the gold standard, right? Um, um, you know, watching that tube go into the cords as opposed to just blindly sticking into a hole. Now, we know that patients are oftentimes very different, and so some people may have a great grade one view, but some people may have a very poor grade three or four view. And so this is sometimes patient limited uh, based on, on the way that uh, airway anatomy is, is oriented. Uh, the second option is the common one that people typically use. It's the CO2 detector. It's the litmus paper detector that turns color with the carbon dioxide expiration um, or exhalation. But you can tell uh, the sensitivity is, you know, on the mediocre side. Uh, and when patients are in cardiac arrest, the sensitivity drops down. And, you know, there's reasons to have false positives. And it really is just a kind of a chemical reaction on a piece of litmus paper. And so there's limitations there. 
Uh, the third one is this tube condensation concept. You know, if you have uh, condensation inside your tube, theoretically, you're having some air exchange. Um, however, is seen in a significant amount of patients with um, esophageal intubations, right? And so the sensitivity is, is really quite poor uh, if you lack condensation. So it's not really that greatest of an indicator. Uh, the turkey baster is what I like to call the esophageal detector. Basically, it's a big bulb that you put on the end of the tube. You you compress it, put it on the tube, and see if it if it expands. Theoretically, if it's in the esophagus, it's um, gonna the collapsing of the esophagus with that negative pressure will preclude the, the bulb from from reinflating. And if it's in the lungs, um, you know, it'd be the the opposite to that. Again, sensitivity specificities are you know, okay. Uh, the one I like to use, at least in the emergency department, is end tidal waveform, right, where you can actually watch not only the number but the waveform. And, you know, the anesthesiologists actually really like this. And if you have a typical waveform post-intubation, it really indicates that the patient has a um, an ET tube in the right place. And a lot of EMS agencies have adopted this for sure. Um, and it's a really good method, right? And I like to use this. Uh, but it's limited in low perfusion states. Uh, and so there may be reasons why this is not the most effective uh, method for you. And so it's going to bring us to this idea of ultrasound. Can we use ultrasound to identify uh, the tube placement if it's in the right place and how far in? Um, and so why do we want to use ultrasound? Uh, the clinical exam really has marginal utility, right? Uh, or marginal reliability, I should say, uh, as we're assessing these different methods. And again, oftentimes you stack one on top of the other and use this kind of collective gestalt assessment with all of them. Um, but each of them individually are kind of marginal. The uh, end tidal CO2 may not give the most reliable results in certain situations. Um, you know, 10 years ago, this was, again, not as common as it is now. Now it seems to be a lot more common and prevalent in departments, and so it has become a pretty decent indicator, but it may not be immediately available to you. Uh, and so, you know, here's another method that you can utilize. Um, and also, a lot of these methods may not be available in austere environments. And so in this slide, I'm just showing a couple different austere environments that, that you may find yourself practicing in. So in the bottom, we're looking at an EMS, the back of the EMS rig, right? So it's, you don't have the full disposal of the hospital resources at your availability. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's, it's by definition a rather austere environment. Top right, we're looking at like a military transport situation. Um, so maybe you're in a C-130, you know, at 30,000 feet, you know, out of theater back to, back to a, um, a hospital. You know, that may not be an environment where you have a ton of resources at your disposal. And the top left there uh, is my father-in-law at the hospital that he worked in um, in sub-Saharan Africa, where they had a lot of resources for being, for what they were, but again, they weren't as fully resourced as maybe a, you know, a, an academic tertiary medical center that we are accustomed to working here in, in the United States. And so all different places where having another ultrasound uh, method may be of benefit to us as we're, as we're assessing the patients. And so um, as we talk about ultrasound, um, we're going to really want to focus it in on two different methods for visualizing this airway, right? We want to do, um, you know, visualizing is the tube in the right place, in the right hole, and then how far down is that tube or the depth, right? So um, the first thing that we're going to talk about is assessing the proper location of that tube, right? Is it in the right uh, right in the right hole, the esophagus of the trachea? So the original study that was done, or one of the original studies that was done, by, was done by one of my colleagues here at Metro Health, uh, Dr. Werner, and and her colleagues um, at the time, and uh, basically they used it to assess the ultrasound um, ab ultrasound's ability to detect endotracheal intubation versus esophageal intubation in patients in the air in the the OR, right? So we'll put on the the methods here. Basically, what they did is they went up to the OR, right, and they consented patients who are getting surgery and said, "Hey, look." We're going to have an anesthesiologist intubate you as part of your normal general anesthesia. But what we're going to do is we're going to sit at the bedside. We're going to take our ultrasound machine and put it on your neck, right? So it's no, it's a you know low, no low risk uh, study, right? We're going to look at your neck, look at the trachea, and see. They're they're actually going to open up a card and say, hey, you're going to preferentially intubate either the trachea or the esophagus, right? We're going to look real quick save an ultrasound clip, and then we're going to pull that out, put it in the right place if it wasn't in the right place to begin with, right? So pretty easy, pretty low-risk um, procedure. It's done by the anesthesi anesthesiologist up in the OR. And what they found when they did this is that ultrasound had 100% sensitivity and 100% uh, specificity for identifying tracheal intubation, right? So 
um, you know, the as things got inserted in the esophagus, they'd be like, yep, I see that in the esophagus. They pull it out and put it back into the trachea and say, looks good here. Uh, it actually got to be, in talking to Sandy, it, it got to be a game where some of the surgeons were looking over the sheet and saying, you know, trying to make the call themselves as well, um, you know, as you know, as, as this is happening. So uh, it's something that was able to be readily identified using ultrasound. So how do you do it? Uh, essentially, you're going to use the linear transducer, right? You're going to tr- um, orient it in the horizontal or the axial uh, or the transverse orientation. Um, and you're going to put it at the suprasternal notch, right? Right at that suprasternal notch. You're going to identify your uh, anatomic landmarks and watch for the passage of the endotracheal tube into the trachea or uh, in the wrong situation into the esophagus, right? And so here's some other literature that um, really helps round out the picture, right? So this study was done um, in 2017. It basically said, where do you look? Like, we, we want to know, like, what's the most effective place to look at? Uh, and so they said uh, they're going to do a tracheal intubation. They looked in three different areas, uh, at the thyroid cartilage, at the cricoid cartilage, and at the suprasternal notch. And they basically found that there's about a 40% uh, visualization rate at the thyroid cartilage, a 70% visualization rate at the cricoid cartilage, and about a 100% visualization at the suprasternal notch, indicating that that suprasternal notch is probably the place to be when you're looking for the airway um, as, as you're do, assessing it with ultrasound, right? And so if you look kind of in, in our ultrasound view, we can see going from the top, the thyroid cartilage, and at the beginning of the clip, all the way down through the cricoid cartilage and scanning down. Now we're kind of clip, looping back through. And you can see what we're looking at is a very prominent rounded air-filled structure in the, that taking up the most of the screen, right? And so if we look over here, let's make that still for a sec. We can see that air-filled structure, that rounded air-filled structure in the midline. On either side, you can see that very homogenous appearing thyroid that borders each side of it, right? Um, and then as we scan, you can see that air signature, right? That ring down artifact that's inside that trachea indicating that the you know, that it's air filled and that it is the trachea. And if you look carefully, just posterior to that trachea and just off to the left, you can see the esophagus, right? Uh, you can see that rounded collapsed structure um, that is representative of the patient's esophagus. And when Sandy did her study, what she found, and she's expre- uh, told me, is that most of the esophagi that she saw, right, that they saw in their study, were towards the patient's left, right? And it makes sense, right? The stomach is going to be over in that direction, so it's going to be kind of on the left-hand side of the patient. Um, however, there was variability, right? Some patients had it to the right, and some patients had it immediately posterior to the trachea, and so there will be some variability to where you find the esophagus, but most patients, know this, most patients have it towards their left, right? So as we continue on, let's put some labels on here so we can just kind of identify things. This is the trachea, right? You can see that air-filled rounded structure in the midline. Uh, over here is the thyroid, right? That homogenous thing that's, that borders the trachea on either side. And then you have your esophagus right there, right? It's that collapsed rounded structure that's going to be just off to the side of the trachea in this patient, right? Uh, so we're going to go back to live. And as you intubate this patient, you'll notice that there's some movement um, of air inside that trachea, right? You can see kind of the echo texture changes just a touch, and there's a lot of you know movement of the trachea itself as the tube is passed. And so let's look at some of the pictures from um, from the original study here. Um, in on the left side, we see an example of a trachea that's filled with basically an ET tube that's intubated, right? You can see that air signature inside that rounded trachea, and that's it, right? However, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you can see an esophageally intubated patient, right? So you can see the trachea still has an air signature, maybe a little bit different, a little less ring down, but right next to it, you also have a second air signature inside the esophagus. It's got that double barrel shotgun sign, and this is what an esophageal intubation looks like. And if we go live, we can see how that's going to appear, right there as the the tube is passed you can see the presence of an esophageal airway essentially as as they're intubating the patient so we'll watch it again here you see the esophagus just off to the right hand side of the screen the tube is passed all of a sudden you have a second air filled track uh, which would represent an esophageal intubation compare that with this one this is a tracheal intubation where you can see some movement a little bit of change in the air signature but it all stays within the context of that single lumen of the trachea. And you can see the esophagus, again, to the right-hand side of the screen, patient's left, 
where there's nothing inside of it, right? You can see it's collapsed down. And there's really no no um, ET tube inside that trachea, right? Again, just to stop it and show uh, when you have that trachea filled with air, particularly with the ET tube, you may notice this additional ring down artifact uh, in the patient that's indicated by the arrows right here, right? So this is a great idea, right? There's a lot of utility, a lot of power to this, but there are some limitations, right? Uh, number one, it's best done when you're scanning live, right? If, you, uh, if you're looking at a static image, it's maybe a little bit hard to interpret. Um, so it's best done when it's live, but it doesn't mean you can't see it when it's static. But if you can, watch it as you're intubating. Number two, this technique itself doesn't alone assess the patient's tube depth, right? You're, that, you're gonna have to do something else to figure out, right? And we'll show that in a little bit here. Um, and number three is you've got to be careful with the probe pressure that you're placing because if you put too much probe pressure on, you can actually manually displace some of the tracheal structures and make it really, really hard to intubate from above in the same way that some cricoid pressure may, may improve things or may make things a little bit more challenging, right? So how does this technique stack up with other literature? Well, this study was done in 2013, uh, showed ultrasound confirmation of endotracheal tube placement during CPR, right? And they showed a sensitivity that was really, really good, 100% sensitivity. Specificity lacked a little bit, 85%. Um, but again, CPR is in process. It's a little bit more of a challenging environment. But I think what we're seeing in this study is, again, a similar high sensitivity that would make this a, a viable solution for patients uh, as you're trying to confirm in, um, tube placement in these in these high risk environments, right? Second, here's a feasibility study of bedside airway uh, ultrasound compared to capnography, a uh, waveform capnography, capnography to um, assess for tube location. Um, in, uh, ultrasound had basically a, a high sensitivity, 98% high specificity for tube placement. And what was interesting is they showed a mean time to assess it and the patient's mean time assessment was about 16 seconds. And so it was a pretty rapid thing that you can get done. It's certainly a lot faster than wheeling a chest X-ray in, snapping an image, crowding around the screen and taking a look at what's going on, right? So that's a pretty interesting technique, right? It shows us that the tube is in the right place, right? In the trachea as opposed to the esophagus. There's another technique that you'll find in the literature using lung sliding to see if you're in the right place. And theoretically, at least the theory behind this one is, hey, if I put the tube in the right place, and ventilate them, I should see some evidence of that ventilation when I look at the lungs, right? If I look at the left lung, if I look at the right lung, I should see some movement as you ventilate that patient. If I don't, then I have to be highly concerned that I'm not ventilating the patient appropriately, right? Uh, and so this study was done by, um, um, by uh, Dr. Weaver, Dr. Blyvis, Dr. Lyons and the, the company in 2006, basically looking at this idea of lung sliding, right? Can you identify that the tube is in the trachea with lung sliding, right? And they basically took two scanners and they had one scan, checked their sensitivity specificity, did another one, checked their sensitivity specificity, and basically found that the sensitivity is pretty high, right? 95 or 100% for scanners one and two, and specificity is pretty high, 100%, right? So it looked pretty good. The next question is, can this be utilized to identify a right mainstem intubation, right? And this is where things fell off a little bit. Specificities remain high, 93% and 100% for scanners one and two. But it was, the sensitivities were kind of low, 96 or excuse me, 69 percent and 78 um, percent to identify the right main stem bronchus intubation uh, as part of the patient's assessment. So it has some te it has some valid or validity. Um, may not be the best um, study that you can utilize um, for you know as a standalone. But basically, how do you do this? You take your transducer. Uh, in this, in their study, they did a micro or a convex transducer, but you can pick whatever transducer um, is available to you. Uh, doing the sagittal orientation, right? And you, uh, what they did in their study was a midclavicular or anterior axillary line uh, location, and they assessed on either side, do you have lung sliding? And so the idea is, if you have something that looks like this, right, you have that movement back and forth, so you have lung sliding, you have aeration um, of that lung. Uh, we can throw some M mode on it and see that Sandy Beach sign. That would again further indicate that you have lung sliding, right? As opposed to this one right here, you have no lung sliding. So you have that plural line, a uh, couple ring down artifacts, and there's no lung sliding there, uh, which suggests that there's no ventilation in that particular lung. The caveat to all that, and what makes this challenging, is what if the patient has a concurrent pneumothorax, right? 
So here's a patient, here's an example where you have uh, a lung point that shows up and this patient has a pneumo, right? So you'll have no lung siding, whether the tube is in the right place or wrong place on the side that the patient has a pneumothorax. And so this is one of the huge limitations um, as you're evaluating patients with this particular technique. So that brings us to the idea of we assess the location, right? Is the tube in the right place right, or the wrong place? We looked at a couple different ways of finding that. The, number, the second one is, is it at the right depth, right? Um, and so, again, remind ourselves of the study we just looked at. Um, specificity is pretty decent. Sensitivity is a little bit poor on this particular uh, study using the lung sliding technique to assess for depth, right? The thought is, if I pushed it too far, I'll have sliding on one side and I won't have sliding on the other side, right? And so why do you have that spec low specificity? You know, you can have some movement um, of one side of the chest with the other side, right? So if you have right main stemmed, right, you're inflating the right side, there can be just with the, you know, the expanding and contracting of the chest, some small amount of movement of that left chest. Secondly, you can have what's called a lung pulse, right? So the lung itself um, can be moved by the beating of the heart. And so as the heart meets, beats back and forth, you get this slight rhythmic uh, vibration of that lung, which you can see here, right? Um, you can see the Sandy Beach sign, and then you can actually see that rhythmic nature of it on the M mode. And you can, interestingly, you can use the OB calipers and calculate what the heart rate is uh, based on this lung pulse. But this is the reason why you may see sliding, right? Uh, artifactual sliding, and they still are right main stemmed. So there's a couple other studies that have been done uh, to assess this idea of tube depth, right? This is a study that was done uh, back in 2017 where they actually measured the endotracheal tube depth uh, using ultrasound. And they had this very complex method here um, of assessing you know, distances uh, from various different structures to the aortic arch uh, and use that as a prox uh, proxy to figure out how far they were in terms of their depth. Um, and it was okay, right? It, it just showed some some potential feasibility, but, you know, more work, their conclusion was basically more work needed to be done. The study that I've found to be fascinating, and it hasn't really come to prime time in terms of management in our department, but I still think the idea is, is rather interesting, um, is this study, the trust study that was published in 2015. So this was done in pediatrics. Um, and what they did is they assessed, can we take this pediatric population, right? We're going to assess to see what they're intubated, right? We're going to assess to see if it's in the right main stem or the trachea. And, but to do that, we're going to fill this, uh, this cuff, right? The cuff of this, the tube with saline, right? We're going to use a linear transducer in the horizontal orientation at the supersternal notch, right? So they identified the anatomical rotation. And what they wanted to see is they wanted to see if there was a change in the signature associated with that saline filled balloon uh, at that supersternal notch to indicating, you know, like these decided this location here is probably a good tube depth location if we see the balloon at that supersternal notch, right? So here on the left, you see in the pre intubation state, right? You can see that trachea that's got that, that big shadow um, due to the air uh, that doesn't allow you to see any structures be beneath that, right? And then theoretically, right? And this is the theory behind the study if you fill that tube with balloon or that saline with, with excuse me, if you fill that balloon with saline, now all of a sudden you'll have a, a medium that the sound will penetrate, right? You can see through it, um, and but the core of that tube will still be filled with air and you won't be able to penetrate through it. And so if you have an enhanced visualization of the structures behind the airway um, on either side of the midline, then you are likely to have the, the saline filled cuff in, immediately beneath your tube, right? Because you can now transmit ultrasound through the sides of that you know, that cross section because they're filled with saline as opposed to the middle, right? Uh, so the, the right hand image shows a saline filled cuff with those structures that are visualized beneath it or behind it. And the middle one shows essentially if you went too far, right? If you know you're in the right place and you went too far um, or didn't go far enough, uh, you would still have air. And so you'd have that, that continued full width of the trachea uh, shadowing of the posterior structures, right? Um, that would be representative of a main stem or a, a very shallow intubation, right? And so I guess you look at your tube depth and identify that it's main stemmed or not. Um, and what they found is a really, really, really high sensitivity, right? A 98% sensitivity uh, as they're assessing for, for tube depth in these children. So I thought this was really, really helpful, right? Um, there's been, you know, 
a study that was done in adults uh, that showed some similar findings. Uh, and I think there's more work that can be done to decide if this is going to be helpful, especially in places where maybe ultrasound is going to be your, your, your be your confirmation method of choice. I mean, certainly in the emergency department, we have a lot of ways that we identify this, and ultrasound isn't always our identification method. But if this is the way you do you utilize, um, or y this, if this is what you utilize to identify that depth, then then perhaps a saline filled cuff is going to be the thing for you. So that brings us through kind of how do we use ultrasound to identify location and depth, some complications. The final thing that we need to talk about today is our failed airway, right? And so for a failed airway, right, we have basically um, a lack of ability to oxygenate or ventilate. Uh, so that's going to lead us down our cri cri route. So as we prep for the crike, we need to think about some anatomy, right? Because this is really going to come down to making the cut in the right place, right? You can do that, that vertical cut on the superficial skin and then dissect down to the cricothyroid membrane, make that horizontal cut, and basically insert a tube in that now opened up airway. Um, so things that we, key landmarks that we need to identify is the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage in these patients. Typically, it's done with your finger, right? You assess uh, with your finger the, the thyroid cartilage and then kind of that soft spot between, and then the cricoid cartilage that's just beneath that, right? Uh, but when we have patients who are maybe a little bit, um, you know, have a little bit thicker necks, this may be a little bit more challenging as we want to um, assess these assess these patients, essentially, and try to identify that landmarks, right? And so the thought is, is can we use ultrasound to assess some of these landmarks uh, in preparation to make our cut? So this was a study that was done, uh, basically bedside sonography by emergency physicians for rapid identification, identification of landmarks for cricothyrotomy. So it's an early study, 2008, that said, yep, we can, we can identify these structures. And we fast forward to 2012. Uh, this is basically a study that was done, ultrasound-guided, bougie-assisted crikes, um, describing this new technique. And they showed, what was interesting, the number that was interesting in the study is they basically showed the time to identify the cricothyroid membrane was about 3.6 seconds. So it was actually pretty rapid to put that probe down and say, there it is, that's where I'm going to make, um, make my incision, right? Here's another study that was published in 2014, uh, similar authors, and they basically said, okay, this is all well and good, but we're going to lay the patient down, right? We're going to try to intubate them, right? And then we're going to come back and say, yep, yeah, we need to crike them. But if you've done a measure, if you've done an assessment beforehand, and then you crike them later, how much movement is there between the beginning and the end? And they found when they reassess them, there's about a 13 millimeter average movement of the airway structure. It's kind of as you're repositioning that neck, which was kind of interesting, right? Um, and then moving on from there, um, there's this study done in 2016 that uh, was talking about the accuracy of identifying the cricothyroid membrane uh, with ultrasound. They said, uh, what was interesting, this one's a little bit of a fly in the ointment, but this one basically said, uh, with palpation, the accuracy is about 67%, which is pretty lousy, right? To, you know, for such a, a critical structure, if you feel it and say about 67% of the time you got it right. Uh, with ultrasound, it only went up to about 69. So again, I said it's a little bit fly in the ointment, but there was a slight improvement um, to identify. And they did say that it did take a little bit longer with ultrasound to identify that cricothyroid membrane than with palpation techniques. And I think there's probably going to be some, um, some patient variability inside this. But taking this all together, I think what it means for us is basically, yes, you can use ultrasound to identify this. In fact, it probably is really helpful to identify it with ultrasound. But since it may take a little bit of extra time, and it may not be the, um, you know, the holy grail of, of cricothyroid uh, imaging, um, may want to do this in advance, right? Get, get yourself all prepped and ready to go so that when everything kind of falls apart and the, you know, the wheels fall off, that you're ready to go and you can make your cut. And so I really like the technique or the, the mindset that was presented by uh, Dr. Scott Weingart uh, with his Crycon method of assessing the urgency uh, with which you should have, uh, with which you should do your, your Crike. And essentially, um, if you are on a high le Crycon level, Crycon 5, you... You know, you know it's there. You're kind of getting things mentally ready. And with su successive levels, kind of getting down to Crycon 1, you're doing more and more to prep your patient in advance before you take away their airway, um, their well, their mental status and their airway reflexes with your medications so that you're ready to go, you know, should everything happen and the wheels fall off for this patient. And so what you can do is use your linear transducer and the sagittal orientation, identify the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, have it marked and ready to go, have your kit ready to go, 
and then when the you know when it's necessary, then um, then make your make your incision. Right. And so how do you do this? Right. So here's an example uh, with some labels on there with a thyroid cartilage. Right. Uh, labeled there is kind of that cartilaginous structure with a shadowing. And then on the right hand side, you see your cricoid cartilage, uh, that oval shaped uh, darker structure. And then the the membrane just beneath that is going to be your cricothyroid membrane. That's what we're looking for. And finding this itself, just plopping and playing, is a little bit challenging. So what I like to do is basically go to the suprasternal notch in the vertical orientation, find that string of pearls that represents your tracheal rings. The biggest one at the top is going to be tr your cricoid cartilage. And then immediately above that, it's going to be your thyroid or cricothyroid membrane. Um, so if you scan from the midline and work your way up, it can be pretty easy to find once you've identified some of the basic uh, preparatory landmarks. So let's come on back to our case here that we started off, right, with our newfound knowledge of ultrasound guided airway management. Let's see how we can assess this patient. So we have a 34 year old, remember, who was involved in a motor vehicle accident, severe head and tra chest trauma, and their vitals are decompensating, right? They're, um, they're hypo becoming hypotensive, becoming bradycardic, becoming progressively more and more hypoxic, right? So throw the ultrasound probe on, boom. There it is, double barrel shotgun sign. We have an esophageal intubation. So let's fix that thing, right? Let's replace that tube, put it in the trachea right there. And we can use the ultrasound to look for lung sliding now. We can see some sliding on the left lung, right? You can see some sliding on the right lung. And now we know we have a tracheal intubation. We have bilateral lung sliding. Our vital signs are improving and the patient saved, right? Okay, a little bit of a cheesy example, but it just shows that we can utilize this in real time to assess these patients, whether pre-hospital with ultrasound or they're in the ED as we're troubleshooting why this patient is decompensating in front of us. So just as a little bit of a recap, we talked today about how ultrasound can be used to confirm the location of your, intuba of your intubation, right? We're gonna do the transverse orientation over the trachea, right? We're gonna look for some air in the trachea and not in the esophagus, right, is our primary method. We're going to look at lung sliding to see if it's moving left and right um, to see if we're in, you know, in the airway, if we have a reasonable location uh, or if we're main stemmed. If you really want to be slick, you can fill that cuff with saline, see if you can get that, that um, fluid-filled signature uh, behind the trachea. Um, and then also if you're thinking down the route of a potential failed airway need for surgical airway, you can use your ultrasound to assess for your correct thyroid membrane, find that location so that when the, you know, the wheels fall off and you really, really need to, to make the cut, you are ready to do so. So with that said, let's wrap things up there. Uh, we will reconvene next week uh, for more of the ultrasound grand rounds. But in the meantime, thank you for joining us. I hope you found today helpful. Again, please hit that subscribe button. We'd really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.